so this is office hours uh, for today. Um, if anybody needs anything, uh, any resources or our help with any roadblocks, then then please go ahead and speak up. Um, but just to, to catch us up and, and have an office hours and, and talk about all the adventures and misadventures over the past couple of weeks. Um, so, so James, why don't, why don't you start off uh, in case in case you have to get going because of your school or uh, repair schedule? I'm actually uh, we're we're doing good here because I just finished finals for the previous term uh, last week, so I finally okay. got a break and I can focus more on FPGA for oh, good. at least Con the next couple of weeks before things get started again. So, yeah. hey, congratulations on uh, on completing another a big chapter of school. That's a, that's a big deal. Did it go okay? Oh yeah. Uh, everything Good. went pretty well, and I'm fairly happy with what I've done and what more is to come. How oh, great. That's that's fantastic news. Good to hear. Yeah, FPGAs. Um, yeah, plenty going on there. Um, we have the 9009 and the 9002, which are the radio cards. Uh, the 9009 is on a ZC106, uh, which is a very nice dev board, the 7000 series Zinc on it. That's one station. That's the transponder station is is what we've started to call it, uh, intended for for transponder work. And then the other station is a ZCU 102. Uh, we also have a ZCU 106 sitting to the side, um, but the ZCU 102 directly supports the ADRB 9002, which is a another radio card by Analog Devices, and that radio card. Uh, gives you access to a chip that's designed for low power and mobile applications. So that's the one for the Neptune project, the drone project. That'll be the first customer. And the ZCU uh, 102, the U is kind of a hint. It's an ultra scale um, chip. So the challenge when last we left ourselves was to get a version of Linux working uh, on on both of these stations. The 9002 is intended to be used with MATLAB and HDL Coder, which is a toolbox from, from MATLAB, from MathWorks, that lets you go from MATLAB and Simulink to HDL. And it also has some FPGA in the loop uh, and test bench functionality. And they recommend using their version of Linux, which is called BuildRoot, and that has been quite the odyssey, which we've documented in a couple of different places. Uh, internally and also externally on the MathWorks community site in a long write-up. And then we have an immense thread uh, with some very helpful people at, at MathWorks. It's unexpectedly difficult um, to to get the uh, the MathWorks version of BuildRoot built. And they're, they advertise this this version of Linux, uh, embedded Linux, to, to go on the platform as uh, efficient and easy and simple and will make your life better. So our feedback has been that it's not done that for us, at least. Um, we are using a supported combination of the development station and the radio card. Um, but putting in the, the radio card, which you have to put it in with the, the through the device tree. So you have to modify the device tree to include the, the radio card that fits into the FPGA development station. Um, that part's almost totally undocumented. Uh, we do have some experience with some successful builds of Petal Linux um, on, on the other station. And it's uh, right before IMS 2023, the International Microwave Symposium, which was last week. Uh, so right before that, um, we went ahead and tried to build Petal Linux for the 9002 station as well. So that's where we were. Um, and we, lot, through lots of feedback, um, we we went into IMS uh, 2023 week. It's a week long microwave um, set of conferences, and I was a volunteer and organizer uh, for the conference. So I spent the entire week at the conference. Both Analog Devices and MathWorks were both there, and they gave multiple uh, presentations. And one of them had a workshop, and they both had a large booth with lots of people. So this was an excellent opportunity to talk about the challenges that we were having and to ask questions about uh, you know, some of the, the process and the workflow and tools. Now, Xilinx wasn't there, but there was a lot of people with familiarity with, with the Xilinx there. And the good news is that we did get all the way up to getting a, a, a ticket entered into, the, into analog devices internal system to try to resolve our weird version skew problem, yet another problem with the, uh, with the stations. 
So, uh, so that happened. It was very good to to talk to these folks in person um, and to be able to go from one booth just a few rows down to the other uh, and try to harmonize all these different versions. Um, so like any sort of complicated system where you have development cards and, and products from different companies, it multiplies in, in the complexity. And the main challenge that we have is understanding which versions of what tool are compatible. And there has to be a Venn diagram where at least uh, where all of this stuff overlaps with the in terms of compatibility. It's been um, probably more effort than it should be to figure out exactly how to how to set the stations up. We're really, really close. And and kind of the, the good news about all of this, the good news is that lots of progress was made talking to people in person. Um, and there's some interesting gossip that I got. The the good news is that Petalinux actually built and and ran for both stations. So I stopped working on the MathWorks build route right before IMS and got got a build of Petalinux for the Neptune station as well. I think we should go ahead and try to use Petalinux with HDL Coder and the FPGA thing in the loop and just go ahead and try it. And it may be that we have to build the MathWorks version of Linux to get all of their functionality working. But when I tried to pin them down to tell me exactly what was special about their version of Linux, they couldn't tell me. So it could be that they it's just not invented here syndrome and that they would really like for you to use their version of, of Linux, but it is not as well supported uh, by far. It's not as well supported as uh, Xilinx, Petalinux or the analog devices version of embedded Linux called Kuiper. So that's that's it from my end. And uh, if you have any questions about all this complicated stuff, uh, you know, I'm very sorry. It's lots of acronyms and versions and stories and 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 potential paths. Um, you know, but we're we're just trying to be uh, sort of relentless about this and solve these problems and get all of the tools and the tool flow and the new stations uh, set up. Um, so we're we're trying to do that as quickly as possible, and I think we're we're pretty much almost there. We're there with Petalinux, and and the only outstanding question is uh, the profile mismatch with the, the software from analog devices. In order to control the transceivers, the API versions have to match in Linux and in their utility program, and they don't. And sure enough, the profiles don't load. That's a big problem. And then the other big problem is trying to build whatever special sauce MathWorks has in their version of BuildRoot which I'm starting to suspect there isn't really a functional difference. It's all live IIO calls underneath. So that's uh, that's the giant ball of wax uh, as, as concisely as I can try to explain it. And then I'm gonna, I'll hand it over to Paul. He, I think he has at least one story about the outage uh, that we had at the lab, which I, th I think is pretty interesting. Um, and then anything, anything else he has to, to talk about. Okay. Um, first on compatibility and profiles, I've come to understand that there's there's a transition underway from an old way of doing things to a newer way. And we seem to be caught in an awkward place right now where you can't use IIO exclusively because it doesn't give you control of all the setup and all the details of what you have to do to get the setup to work sample rates and frequencies and stuff like that, filter coefficients. Those things are not exposed by the IAO uh, API, as far as I can tell. They're exposed at a lower level at a, a proprietary API, which is where the, the versions have to match. And so you're stuck. If you want to use IIO, which is the more modern way of doing things, you still have to do your configuration with these profiles. And the profiles can't really be generated by hand. They have to be generated by this application that that analog devices provides because it's the only thing that knows all the rules. And uh, if you give it a very vanilla set of parameters like the defaults and a sample rate that matches one of the sample rates that they traditionally use, then it seems to work. Um, if you do anything wrong, then it get, generates a profile that it's just not accepted. There's no error message. It just says no. <laughs> and this is not very helpful and very difficult to debug. So I think we'll be stuck with 
tiny incremental changes and hope we can get from the default to where we need to be in a reasonable sort of way. And the, the application program does try to diagnose problems. If you give it a set of invalid parameters for clock rates, for instance, it will tell you that such and such a clock rate has to be greater than that one and you know uh, between this value and that value. And typically, in, in our case, where we're trying to do something relatively narrow band uh, on a wide band radio, what we want is outside the boundaries. So if, we, if that application is right about what the boundaries are, and we have to assume it is, then we're forced into this configuration, which is much higher uh, sample rates than we could possibly hope to handle in, in pure software. So if that's a real limitation, and I, I'm, I believe it is, then that means we won't be able to talk to this radio strictly with software. We're going to have to uh, impose at least a couple of layers of, of interpolation in the FPGA fabric, even if we don't otherwise need it, just to get up to a sample rate it can handle, which will then filter back down to the, to the signal we want. And that problem, I think, is, might be specific to the 9009, the, the larger radio card that we have the one for the transponder right that's the because the 9002 can go down to 12 kilohertz okay i have not tried to do anything with the 9002 so i i can either confirm or deny that theory yeah i helpful. think that yeah the 9009 is very similar in capability and sort of style to the 9371 um which is very very high you know this is a very capable radio card but the as far as I can tell, the lowest sample rate that we can, well, not sample, but the lowest bandwidth it'll do is 30, 30 megahertz. You know, it's like, a, you know, 30, 30 samples per second, something like that. So we were aiming for 10 um, and or 10, you know, 10-ish. Uh, that, that, and that's a, a pretty big difference. But that's, that's very true of the 9009. Um, we may just want to get it working at a higher bandwidth and sample rate and you know, first, and then and then work on on narrowing it down later, um, or or whatever. But if we get good advice on on this from from people with good systems knowledge, then then we'll take it. Um, but over on the Neptune station, that the, the uh, that's a it's intended for to support narrowband modes, and it so it'll go down to twelve kilohertz. So so this problem is is not as uh, acute uh, on the Neptune station. That's good. Uh, my my mission at the moment was to do do the uplink demo on the nine thousand nine, and that was not a particularly critical path thing. It's not something we even need. It was just a. I thought it would be an easy thing to try on the on the nine thousand nine station transmit side, and if it turns out it's just plain not, then I'll abandon that uh, and go back to the Pluto for uh, demonstrating the narrowband stuff. Uh, which is actually closer to what we need for for the uh, uplink anyway. Okay. So that's where that is. In uh, in other remote lab news, there's a, a server software upgrade pending now, uh, which we will probably want to adopt at some less disruptive moment than than more. When exactly that is, I'm not sure. We we did go through some pain and agony. Um uh, due to a disk full situation, which has all sorts of nasty consequences, we were able to sort ourselves out of it by moving some stuff and deleting some stuff that was no longer needed and had enough headroom to uh, to put it back into a working condition. That's on version 6.11 of Unraid, which is the Linux version that runs on the server underneath all the virtual machines. We knew that 6.12 was coming, and now it's here, and it's starting to nag and say, your operating system is not up to date, and there are some advantages. There's new file systems, which might not have the same kind of limitations. Um, so at some point, we'll take the system down, and hopefully for a very short time, and bring it back up on 6.12. I'll probably do that on the... Uh, uh, lab south machine first because it's not under heavy use and when when that works hopefully should be straightforward then uh, 
try it on the remote lab west system and hopefully it won't disrupt the the workflow for for very long i uh, i think i covered did i cover the story you wanted me to tell i wasn't entirely sure which one you were referring yeah to. the uh well there's there's lots of stories um plenty of good stuff going on but no the yeah the the I thought the outage was pretty interesting, the the disk full situation, because it kind of caught us by surprise in the middle of a build. So everything just completely froze. Um, yeah, completely caused, unresponsive. Yeah, yeah but it, it just it, full stop, you know, no, no mouse, no nothing, no. Uh, so so the fear was, oh, dear, you know, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, but it, but it did. It turned out to be a disk full. We thought maybe there was a, a, a disk failure. Um, and how how it got full is still a mystery to me because uh, it's it's not obvious when you when you kind of run the command line diagnostics that that it was it was too uh, too full. So I, I I do not know that all the ins and outs, but I think what happened is that we had overfilled it uh, by doing repeated builds uh, on the system disk essentially, and we, we caught ourselves real, real, realizing this was going to be a problem and deleted some builds, uh, which should have given us headroom for quite a while. But because of the way this particular file system stack works, uh, you end up with uh, blocks allocated that stay allocated, even if you delete the files that they're holding. And this is one of the problems with this file system that we're currently using for, for the cache drive. And one of the reasons why we want to do the, the overall system upgrade so we can get that file system replaced with something a little bit more predictable <laughs> okay uh, well what about today would today be a good day to try to do it uh, yeah it might be i don't i'm not aware of anybody besides the two of us who have been using it heavily lately and we can well you said you time. you wanted maybe to to use uh maybe try this on the on, at remote lab south to to pilot it yeah, that'll more pilot pilots the upgrade process, but since there's nothing, no actual work happening on that system, we won't be able to tell that it doesn't disrupt work. Well, um, we can, we can, we can certainly start some work there. That's that <laughs> is the goal. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's hello, by the way. Um, Hi there. I uh, sitting here listening. Um, so my my background is in software engineering or software development, I don't have a degree, um, and uh, systems administration. And I'm wondering, do we have, like, first of all, was that an inode starvation issue? It sounded like maybe uh, you were saying the blocks weren't getting freed, but also uh, do we have like monitoring on critical systems so that we can catch those things before they bite us? And if not, is there an app site for setting up like Munin or something to keep track of what's going on on important machines? We're running with under the Unraid supervisor, which uh, does some monitoring. And that's how I knew what was going on in the first place. It, it let me know, uh, but more monitoring might, might be helpful. I'm not sure that the inode thing sounds like old fashioned operating systems. That yeah. I don't know. I don't know. EXT2 was inodes. I don't know what EXT3 and, and, and uh, XFS and the rest of them use, but I'm, I'm sure they have a similar like abstraction underneath that, um, this cache file system is ButterFS. Okay. And the recommendation is once we're up to the new version of the OS is to use ZFS instead. And I believe that's a little more conventional. Yeah, definitely. Um, is, I've heard of ZFS at least and, and have installed it. I've never, I've, I'm looking at uh, ButterFS now, but cool. Um, yeah, if there's anything I can do to help out, like I said, I have a background in, um, systems programming, systems uh, administration, uh, almost all Linux. So I'm um, happy to help out if I can. Cool. Thank, Thank you me. very much. So I think that wraps up my report. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. That 
I think some good yeah, advice sure. from somebody with some experience would, would help. I mean, we have, not, not we've recent. learned a lot. Uh, well, that's okay. Yes. <laughs> not recent admin experiences. You know, I'm, I'm still talking about inodes in 2023, but uh, the concepts, I think, translate. So, and, and I have I have friends that are still working actively in industry. So I at least have resources to pull from if, if, uh, if we've got questions. So anyway, uh, glad to help if I can. Thank you. Yeah, let's see. We have, uh, what else is going on in the labs? Um, any uplink, any uplink progress over the past couple of weeks? It's been been since we since we last talked. Uh, anything about Opulent Voice that you want to share? No, the uh, working toward making the transmitter transmit uh, is the Opulent Voice development path right now, and it's been kind of stalled out. Um, so I don't have anything new to report there. Okay, yeah, maybe we can I do want to. You know, I want to create something that more and more like a real transmitter, you know, with push to talk and uh, actual interfaces to microphones and, and such instead of, you know, file to file and simulation work uh, so we can find out what the new problems we don't know about are. Uh, hopefully that'll all just work once we get past the, the, the slugging, uh, yeah, the slogging through getting it all built i um i did want to ask uh you were talking about uh configuration files for i'm guessing analog uh one of the analog devices ics is that a one and done thing or is that something you have to generate every time you start up or like what is oh it's a really good question um so they are they're files that you generate with their utility um and depending on the IC, you may have a single um, human readable text file, or you may have a JSON file and then a binary file. The binary file will go to the ARM, and the text file gets read in to um, the, the system directory through the system to directly to the devices uh, with a cat. You cat and redirect it to this. Uh, okay. It pretty neat, you know, like but your character, you're, character a block device or something. Yeah, okay. it's a little, you know, you're so it feels like you're mucking around with the central nervous system, nice. and that happens when it when it's as far as I can tell, that happens when it starts up, and so it is sort of one and done in that you figure out your your clock scheme, your sample rates, your bandwidths. Uh, there's you know, there's uh, some gain settings in there. ADC settings, whatever that particular IC needs. There's a pretty long list. This stuff's documented in the uh, the, the user guide. Uh, and documented the, oh, the, sorry, in terms the, of like using their app to manage it, I manage it, I take it, not like the binary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, to, to create this profile, which then lives inside your 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 deployed system, you know, to create these files, you, you use their utility. And and all of these settings, all these registers, are they are all documented in the, the programming guide, so it's not super secret, but it is an enormous amount of, you know, configuration, the configura configuration files, the ones that are human readable when you when you look at it. They sort of look to me like they mirror the device tree. So they're, you know, there's all these settings and they're grouped into to blocks of, of settings and they sort of look like that to me. But once <laughs> and, you've got it. Once you've got it generated and working for the device, it's not like you have to regenerate it every time you spin up. It's a, it's like a byte stream you you dump into it when it starts up. And yeah, so I was just wondering because you were talking about version uh, conflicts yeah. and yeah, the version uh, conflict is between the the what the Linux version that you have and the API in Linux, and then the API that's buried in the utility tool, which is proprietary and comes from analog devices. And the reason why this has been a very tricky thing um, is because analog devices only publishes the absolute latest version of this utility. However, we are using 2021.1 Petal Linux and the 2021.1 version of the HDL reference design from analog devices uh, right. in order to use the transceiver toolbox from analog devices and a lot of other stuff. So there, it's weird that this, you know, well, I guess it's not too weird. If you've ever actually worked at a, a company where there's a, a significant amount of people and there's different departments, you do know that sometimes they don't talk to each other. Oh yeah. And, and that is what I was told at the booth is that these are two teams that are not communicating well during this 
you know, because it used to be there was no version, uh, really. Uh, the TES, the transceiver evaluation software, produced a file for a particular radio chip. And that was the file that you use the utility to create the file. And if you in the different versions of TES all produced at least the same format. But what they've done is they've started changing the format between these versions. So this version skew means the profile that it produces if it does not perfectly match the version of Linux that you, you're targeting, then it, it will just simply fail silently in what most cases. It is a nightmare. And I, I use that word uh, at the booth politely to the nice uh, FAE that, that after drilling down for uh, a couple of layers uh, of, of very nice people at the analog devices booth, it hit somebody that was familiar with their this particular part of their product line. And and he he was extremely empathetic and understood what I the problem Im immediately. So your and, option is basically never to upgrade. Like once you get it working, just never upgrade. Yeah, never lose your copy of Tez that you managed to get uh, distributed or go. F and so we went to the Internet Archive. That was Paul's idea. He says, well, why don't we just look in the Internet Archive and see if we can find this version? Well, we found every version before and and we found the version after, but the particular uh, one from early <laughs> from early 2023, this was the last it was available was it looks like around January 2023 was not uh, snapshotted by Internet Archive. So I put, put a appeal out on LinkedIn and and on our list and, and everything. So somebody's got to have a, a, an install laying around. It's Windows only, so it's just a little must tiny be an install archive there, right? Like they've got to have a build. Like they do an artifact server somewhere with these. They do. Them. You would. I. I agree with you. So I attempted to Earl hack at analog devices for about a half hour, and uh, and and f make it regurgitate it somehow, maybe through their, uh, you know, through all of their different directories. Um, and I've written several people that I know, and the answer, and also posted on Engineer Zone, which is where you're supposed to go for all the tech support. And uh, it has not. Uh, Hasn't worked yet, um, you know, but I am going to keep chipping away. And, uh, and you know, I, I think that analog devices, once they get through this transition and kind of realize that they're, they're, you, their own product, like the transceiver toolbox, only works with 2021 uh, era stuff. Like it has a, a limit. It doesn't work with the latest and greatest of, of Pedalinux or, you know, for a variety of reasons, it's a, since it's targeted for math works. Yeah. You know, so it's their own product that now won't work with with their own product. And, yeah, hopefully and I think, they'll notice. Yeah, I think that you know, with with people like us speaking up about it, um, and I'm I, I have to believe that they have profit, you know, for profit commercial customers that are going like, okay, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, the this sort of insistence of only using the absolute latest version of every of everything. You know, when some of this stuff updates twice a year, like Xilinx updates twice a year, MATLAB updating twice a year. If, if if analog devices can't keep all of their products in lockstep, every, you know, moving forward with each of these these other companies that they're that they're compatible with, then yeah, they're gonna something's got to give, right? So we just like Paul said, I think we're caught in a transition, an ugly transition, and we just got to got to stay persistent and consistent and keep asking and bringing it up, and you know, eventually this this sort of um, the persistence will pay off. Um, and we could just say, well, let's just like we could just back off to a much older hardware, um, but then we'd be kind of giving up, um, you know, modern and and current uh, radio cards and and modern and current FPGAs. We so, would sounds like a reason to spin up a reverse engineering effort to figure out how to talk to these things. Honestly, yes. like if, if yeah, they're, if they're the, the device to use and they're out in the world, like why why shouldn't just anyone be able to talk to them? I agree. The their official line is that the only way to produce these profiles is with the TES TES uh, utility software. And you know what? If it's if you're going to make all the versions available that are all compatible with all the different varieties of of Linux and HDLs and la la la, you know, then fine. But if you're if you're going to restrict it to exactly one yeah. version and the latest, then you're just asking for somebody to try to reverse it. The trick Maybe with the reversing. The <laughs> it, it could be that's a I did not I did not think of that but it could be the the trick with the at least with the 9002 is that it's not just a human readable text file anymore because 
if it is, then right, you can but you can just go it, right. Like I mean, mm -hmm. I mean code it's, it's hard, right? Right, like you know, loading it up in Ida or in Ghidra or whatever is is not not what you want to do with your week. But no, it is. But, <laughs> if you, but that if you is end a up path. There, it's an option, right? That's a good point because the binary file is just an ARM firmware uh, build. It's just off it goes to the ARM, and and that's a it's a it's a fairly yeah. compact. It's a small file, and we and might just be a wrapped config, right? Like might just well yes, and and we we know what's in it because we know what's not in the JSON file. So you can look at the JSON file and then compare that to the older full text files. They used to all be human readable. So you can see which which things have been moved off into the into the ARM firmware build. And and you know it's for ARM and you know which ARM it's for. Right. So this makes it much easier to kind of if analyze you to. if you have to. And I don't know that that actually was the FAE at the booth at IMS eventually said if all else fails you're just going to have to hand edit the profile that you have from the old from the newest tool and and just you're just going to have to do some detective work with the manual and it's like ah eh, okay that's that takes care of the human readable profile it doesn't doesn't necessarily doesn't take care of the binary so i said is the binary the same because is it just uh, you know is is it the same as as it's uh you know if, for all these different versions where it's been a split and he said he thought so so we'll we we worst case we could hand edit the, the profile uh somehow and, and i just i just would but it like you said before these are there's some things that you want to do with your time and then there's there's things that you have to do with your time and you know i would yeah, i would rather be to, you'd rather not yeah, if we don't have to, I'd rather not. So they really do need to clean up this problem. Um, you know, this sort of version skew is the FAE was embarrassed, and so so were the people at the booth when the, when it sank in what was what was going on, and and one well, of them did good. say Maybe that there were other complaints. You know, that we're not the only people. It was like, okay, so tell me, you you guys tell me what versions of all the the, the five different frameworks that have to work together. You tell me what versions we we need to use and. And they were, they were like, oh, oh no, you're right. You know, all of this stuff is correct. You're limited in the in the version of of Linux that you have because of the, our own transceiver toolbox, you know. And you're limited because Xilinx only has these, you know, these versions of their HD, you know, the the stuff that they're pulling into their HDL reference design. There's limitations there. So it's been quite the adventure, and I'm really looking forward to solving this and getting the stations live and working on radio problems because we have we have plowed into this and done and have gotten so far and worked so hard on this that I'm pretty sure our momentum will just will just carry us through into actual on the air problems we will <laughs> it will You're, seem you've done all the hard seem stuff easy. Now, right? yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was just thinking if it was like a if it was a process thing where you had to you know the app loaded the the byte stream or the you know whatever that maybe there was a, a way around it, but it sounds yeah. It, I mean, it sounds like you know what, what the problem is, and it's it's just a supplier problem. I'm just trying to ask questions to get a better handle on it to maybe find a solution. So yeah, your but, questions yeah. are really annoying. Detail about this is that the ver these files that have to be exactly the right version don't have any version information in them. <laughs> yeah. Not any not any readable version information, right? No, there's literally no it's version not... information. Oh, geez. They, they tell you. The binary, I don't know about, but the, even the human readable <laughs> ones don't have anything about what version created them or what version they're intended to work with. That's yeah, awesome. they, they, they tell you to put it, to change the title. And you should, you should change, you should put the version information in the file name. And this is advice that's oh. like fine print buried and you know, way it, down it, in the. No, well, no, this no, is like, this is what you get when hardware engineers write software. You yes. Just not have that problem. Just, just <laughs> yeah. stop those people from writing software, and everything will be fine. Indeed, and because you know it, it, it's true. The hardware engineers run run the place. You know, over yeah. over there, and you can see there are sure are some clear signs. Of... That's that's Bill's code. That's, mm -hmm. You know, Bill Bill wrote that code. Bill manages yes. that code. We right. don't look at that code. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's been quite the adventure. So, and we, I, I got good feedback from the MathWorks booth. Like, uh, so I showed up, and and um, uh, Robin Getz recognized me, and you know, because we worked together uh, in various communities to to put on events and to get 
things done. So he was he was very happy to see me, which is good, you know, because I've written lots and lots of email to MathWorks recently about problems. And he he pulled me aside and he told me that the experiences that we had were directly leading to uh to revisions in their in their product. That, well, that's you know, good. Yeah, and I, I didn't ask which product, but I have to assume that's their build route, you know. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And and you know, the call. I, I great you know i think that that was good so it was good to it was good to hear that they were they'd taken a kind of a hard look and because of our experiences trying to use their stuff that they were they were going to put some some time into making it truly easier to use um i mean if things are broken that's what you want to hear right like yeah. oh, wow they're broken <laughs> and thanks for bringing it to our attention and we'll get it get it sorted that's yeah that's it did make me wonder i mean these there's products like the the xilinx chipsets and the and analog devices ICs, this is like the main, these are the main go-to combinations for lots and lots of telecommunications work. Surely we can't be the only people that have had this problem. This makes me think like, what are what is everybody you, else doing? What You probably are though, right? Like if you think about it, most people aren't building new designs. Most people are maintaining existing designs. So either they're not changing the configurations or they've got tool chains set up from 2000. 21 or whatever um they've got vms running or you know i mean that's the first thing back in the day when you could actually own software like if you did a, a project for a client uh or at least i would have a zip file with the installer for whatever thing it was like you know KiCad, whichever version of KiCad, or whichever version of protel or whatever plus all the files because you you don't want to be stuck looking for a website that's been gone for 10 years when, you know, in 2030, you need to make another one of those boards. So oh, yeah, good you point. can't do that now because, you know, you don't own uh, any of your software anymore. It's all in the cloud and licensed. And yeah, so, uh, but it sounds like, you know, in this case, probably everyone who's using these is, you know, people who are using or who are working on, uh, you know, finished designs that are in production or whatever. And so they've got their build systems set up. Whenever the next thing comes out, and all the new tools for that come out, they'll all, you know, set up build environments and and then never upgrade those. That's the thing that kills me is that like, you're talking about a Linux system. So there's a driver in this Linux system. And if you update the driver now, uh, and which I would assume happens when you update the underlying OS to, you know, address any other vulnerabilities, well, now suddenly your config files don't work anymore. So you've broken your product by doing what everyone wants you to do, which is keep your stuff up to date. Exactly. So that's that's a bigger issue, right? Yes, it is. It's an overlooked issue in the embedded world in general, and it's a very overlooked issue in for FPGA and that's embedded IoT, systems. Right? Yeah, yeah, it or, essentially or is. The, it's it's the, IoT. The T or, stands for something other than things. Yeah, exactly. No, that's very well said. It's and it's entirely true. You know, I mean, well, not sorry. even. I I didn't mean to monopolize. Oh no, you're 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 not. This is this. this we're we're here to talk about stuff there. It's, in this uh, case, the uh, upstream provider is analog devices because they're the primary source for the IIO parts of the Linux kernel. And the drivers there, are, I think it's analog devices all the way down. Yeah, I mean, they're the ones that you would think would have a vested interest in making sure that things worked and, <laughs> yeah. and were secure. <laughs> yes. The, um, the trouble is you can't just settle on one transceiver and say, okay, this one is now well supported and we'll just use it from now on because they turn over. Yeah, well, I mean, we can't we 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 can't sell the next one for fifteen percent more if we don't change everything. <laughs> exactly. Well, the the one that is really well supported is the one that's in the Pluto SDR, and apparently it's on a process node that they can't get anymore. So they, even though they love to keep making it <laughs> and but selling just it, because everybody's upgraded, or I'm not sure what the whole story is, but or like all those lines are now making uh, cheap arms or something. Yeah. It... Yes, that's a. One I think that's probably a factor. But, yeah, the various the various foundries are like they're moving away from the process that the ninety three sixty one was made with. So fewer and fewer new ninety three sixty ones can be created. And, and so everybody's that's, trying to catch up with all the ST parts that you know. Yes. Yeah. Are keeping and, cars and we, sitting in lots. Yep. And we decided, okay, well, obviously we should go on to the next one, which is ninety three seventy one, which is what analog devices wanted us to do but nobody else did. So now it's not a well-supported part and we have to leapfrog to the next one, which isn't well-supported yet. Uh, yeah. Analog yeah, that was the only a... vendor or, or is there... There are other... 
there are other choices. And one of the other, a similar team to like in size to us, it was looking over at, at Intel. They said there was an Intel part that would Intel be. Intel has an RF line? Yeah, I was surprised. It, but where I'm a little leery, a little leery of Intel because when it comes to parts that are kind of outside of their super core business, they will, they'll get into something like IoT or they'll get into something like, like DSPs and then suddenly cancel it. Like, yeah, it's just end of life for no reason out of nowhere. Yes. And like would not phased out in a gentle way. Yeah. Um, like the pl plug is pulled. They Google and like, it. Yes, exactly. And and it's it's even like the the websites of 404. It's oh gosh. just gone because this just happened like it was with, never there. Like it was never there. This happened with smart cities. The the particular embedded processor that was used for the smart city. Um, there's a little like little surveillance pods that are on streetlights. Uh, oh, and, yeah, and yeah. they monitor streetlights and and help with a variety of different things. They're a really neat sort of IoT aggregate, a little pod with. It's like know, what it's, SCADA was supposed to do, right? Exactly. It's like it. Yes, and it's you know they're, they're meshed. They they speak uh, six low pan. You know, they have a backhaul over uh, machine to machine IoT and everything. So this is a great. It, it, actually, if you yeah, look filled, at like the IoT, the yeah, it filled exactly it fills a hole. It, and in terms of the like IoT market, smart cities is one of the largest fractions in terms of like hardware shipped and people working on it. And so San Diego bought in big and. We went to the the hack fest that they threw uh, to try to get people excited about right. They wanted to have their own app store for apps for smart city yeah, pods. Cool. And the the baseline, you know, the the brains of the operation was a uh, I'm blanking on the name of the processor. It was an embedded processor from Intel named after an inventor like the Edison or something like that. Oh, the uh the yes, the Arduino thing that they did that, that they partnered with Arduino. It was like an FPGA uh weird it was like the a weird IA32 thing I think. Like there's some it was some re recycled yes. thing that they were trying to sell yes. as like yeah, it was I think it was Edison. I think that's what it was. I it vaguely was, uh, remember Edison it was like an or inventor's Einstein name or something like that. Yeah, it was like a name, a famous inventor's name. It was also this part was also used in one of the DEFCON badges. I think the skull, the cool skull Terminator badge used it, and we set up the development environment to take a look at it. So that was that was the part that was in the smart city pods. And so we show up at this hack fest. The very first part of it, they do the food, the drink, the the big you know uh, inspiring speech, and then. There's a couple of tables set up, and one of them was the Intel people were there to kind of like with the brochures, and this is what the part that's in it, and, and here is an actual street light sitting here, uh, you know, exposed and everything. That day, Intel had announced this part's no longer available. Oh my god! That day, so I walk right, right up to that poor fellow, and I said, "So, it must be a strange experience standing here talking about." all this future work uh, for a part that has been canceled. And his shoulders sagged. He took a deep breath and he was like, yeah, it's a weird day. Cause he said they're pretty, he was pretty sure um, that he would not be coming back to a job that he would be, oh, no. they would be all laid off. Cause he says, that's what they do at Intel. And, and it'll be well, picked up. They did up. that to arc too, with the whole, the GPU thing, right? Like just mm -hmm. as they were about to release them, they basically said, we're canceling all of the future product line. So why yes. would anyone buy one? Why would anybody buy one? Yeah, it, it, it did say he, he had actually been on a canceled project before at Intel and they, they do kind of catch their own people. So he's hoping like to, like a catch and release process oh. <laughs> that you're thrown out of work and then they court you back and I wished them very well. But like everybody there, when the word kind of spread around, you know, people are looking on their phones saying, look, this part got canceled, you know, and are you going to then have a new part is this the smart city people were totally caught off guard they're like what do you mean it's canceled and they're like well this is a two-year-old design so you know it's infrastructure they're not gonna it's not updated there's no plans to change it you know that hardware team's long gone so yeah this is what is in all of these smart city pods but finding people to write code for it suddenly became a whole heck of a lot harder yeah you know because you're you're going to be yeah, what are you? You're going to be uh, right writing for something that's been having an easier time finding a COBOL programmer. 
Yeah. <laughs> the COBOL programmers yeah, not even kidding. get paid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it'll pay them to go fix the bank mainframe. You know, it was uh, so it was a very interesting uh, hack fest, and and uh, the timing could not have been. That's any more amazing. wacky, you know, that was literally that day, earlier that it's day. It's like they it plan it. It's like the same people did ARC. Like, it, they've just got a guy there that that just loves to see things burn. And, yeah, he <sighs> waits for, for launch day and then cancels things. That's got to be that's got to be what's going on. Yeah, they must have some sort of, they must be, like, really, really committed to some sort of rubric. Like Hold my beard, Google, right? Like yeah. Google, my... <laughs> Google, the Google graveyard has got nothing on these guys. Yeah, it was a, uh, I don't know, market share maybe, or you know, not not enough momentum or whatever they call it when you scale up. Like if it's like, it I all has to be perfect, right? Yeah, so I worked at Salesforce until January. I'd been there for thirteen years, and I got, uh, I'm very pleased to have been laid off, as it turns out. Um, but uh, I saw it there all the time. Like we would get, you know, sixty percent of the way into a project and you know, a big project like, you know, uh, automating uh, capacity ads, right? Things that took a team of, you know, 60 people four months to do. We wanted to get down to, you know, we're, we're just shipping hardware, like white label hardware in and, you know, standing up new capacity daily. Uh, and we, we were getting there, right? We had solutions two different times and two different times they canceled our projects and restarted using entirely new technology stacks with entirely new architecture teams. And uh, it, as far as I know, like the, the solution ended up being, uh, let's just move everything to AWS. Um, wow. But yeah, what, I mean- what, I, what, what, were the, what were they looking for? Were they looking for, the, to, for it to scale up super fast and they would so just the, keep rolling the dice to see that that would happen? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I really don't know. The, so the, the issue was like a, a, a pod, an art like a unit of of hardware infrastructure at the time was something like 12 or 13 60u or 72u rack units um you know it was you know 10 database servers that were 8u each it was you know 60 app servers it was you know a network stack so, i mean it, it was a ton of stuff that had to all be set up you had to uh check all the hardware, you had to inventory to make sure all the uh, peripherals that were supposed to be in each device were there. Uh, for like the file servers, you had to make sure that the um, the WWN on the um, on, on the transceivers was all, you know, matched what you expected. Um, you know, you had to make sure that all memory worked. Like you had to, you had to test every piece of hardware and inventory every piece of hardware. Then you had to cable it according to a patch plan for that particular piece of infrastructure. Um, so everything had to get cabled to the network stack for that pod. And then that, uh, pods network stack had to get cabled into the data center. And so it was just a ton of work. And the, the goal we tried to put in place twice was basically you just rack servers. Like we have three or four different SKUs. We have a database SKU, an app SKU, um, you know, uh, proxy SKUs, like some, some number of, uh, configurations for hardware that covered all of our needs. And then we would just predict basically how much hardware we're going to need over the next year. And we just start placing orders. And as they come in, they get racked and cabled. And what we wrote was, um, I, I uh, repurposed the Red Hat uh, CD installer image uh, to instead of kicking off an, an install, it would go through an inventory, all the PCI devices, it would um, start up um, LLDP and, and watch the network and figure out what switch it was talking to and uh, basically inventory itself and its connections and then uh, connect to a reporting server and tell the reporting server, hi, here I am. This is, you know, this is everything you need to know about me. And then when we would add hardware or add capacity, we would have a, a bomb, a bill of materials for like, we need 60 app servers and 10 database servers and whatever. And it could just go and pull all that inventory out of, you know, all these things have checked in. It could assign VLANs to the ports that they were on to make sure everything was networked properly. And so basically, as long as you're racking hardware as fast as you can order it and get it shipped in, we could keep up with demand. And we were getting there. Like we had the inventory stuff written. Uh, the reporting server was almost done. Uh, I was I, I worked on the data collection and reporting side of it. And we were we were you know, 60% of the way there, maybe 70% of the way there. And they uh, puppet um, 
the team that did Puppet came out with something. Uh, I can't remember what it was called now, but it was basically the same idea, right? It was a network boot image that um, on you put on your default VLAN, and when something booted up, it would inventory itself and check itself into a um, a repository, and you could use their language to configure sort of what host you needed. But it didn't do everything, and so they were going to have to go through and anyway, they canceled our project. They started this one, and at about the same point, three months later, they canceled that one and started something else. And yeah, I mean, the problem never got solved. Wow. And this was, yeah, this was, you know, 2012, 2013. So, you know, eventually we moved a lot of stuff to the cloud and, and that solved a lot of the problem. But, you know, it's, it's no different really than Intel. You know, it's like we, we're not seeing results fast enough. So rather than like, it's, it's, a, it's a sunk cost fallacy fallacy. Oh, right. Right. Like they, they're like, well, we're not, we don't want to throw good money after bad. Well, it's like you haven't given the good money time to work. Right. Um, right. Like it's uh, you, you haven't gotten to the to the finish line yet. Um, and there's just this fear of like, oh, well, if we don't stop and restart now, we'll never get done. Yeah. And, it's like they're making, stopping they're making restarting, decisions. You'll never get done. Exactly. That 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 whole interrupting thing. It, it's just like it's just like the fallacy of of just add more people to make the schedule yeah. to pull the schedule in. But it's a it's a little different axis. It's like the starting and stopping the context switching is just so incredibly expensive. It seems so obvious. And yet, and, and yet I've been at so many companies that do this and, and then you see Intel do it. You would think yeah. Intel would know better. Intel is a giant company. Like they, they have demonstrated the ability to bring products to market and yet, you know. Yeah. These are uh, decisions that are being made at a, there's a derivative going on that, that we're not paying attention to or, or, I, you know, we're aware that scaling up and, and rate and, and velocity, you know, because that's really kind of sounds like what they, they really care about. They want because being first to market is is worshipped, you know, not being best, really. It but if you hurt. can be first and then then gobble up market share that somehow you'll then win, you know, and your shareholders exactly. will be happy. Hand waving here. Yeah. And then like a lot of us pay attention to the distance covered, you know, so. But that that second derivative is what is what people maybe in uh, in the executive suite or or that's the only thing that they're looking at and the distance covered doesn't matter if the second yeah. you know, if the velocity isn't and then I'm sure there's there's even other ways to to slice and dice it you know I guess I'm, I'm not, just I'm, I'm not too ready old to call fashioned anybody idiots right like <laughs> I'm not going to say they're stupid or right like that's the that's the um the impulse is to say, gosh, how can you, how can you be so dumb? How can you like, I'm sure that the math made sense to them, right? Like no one. Absolutely. It makes sense because then shareholders are happy because right. they, the share price goes way up and lots of people yeah. benefit just maybe uh, not the people actually doing the work. Not, not, not the people who, yeah, exactly. The people who are already rich get richer. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so if, uh, if there's other people that had stuff to talk about, I will step back, but I wanted to talk quickly about the thing that I mentioned to you the other day. If you oh understand. sure, yeah, I think we do. Um, Ken, did you have you have any questions or comments for today? Yeah, you know, welcome to the uh, welcome to the meetup to to Ken. He's a, a very experienced ASIC and a designer, and interested in getting more involved in uh, FPGA work. So he's going to be uh, working on. Uh, all sorts of HDL and uh, you know all the things that we've been talking about with the embedded Linux and um, and helping us out with uh, maybe some of the harder harder logic and math. Um, but yeah, Ken, if you had anything that you wanted to, nope. just listening in for now. Thanks. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Mark. You have the floor. Thanks. Um, so it's it's tangentially related to ORI's mission, I think. Um, I mostly wanted to bring it up because I thought if it wasn't something ORI was interested in directly, maybe you'd have some uh, some thoughts as to where I could take it. But um, I have a friend who uh, a few years ago um, started a private internship uh, thing. He found someone who was interested in learning how to, how to code. Uh, he hired them as an intern, um, taught them the basics of what they needed to know and then contracted with them uh, once they were, you know, skilled up uh, and had them work on uh, side projects with him. Um, and I thought the idea was fascinating. Like uh, just the idea of like, you know, lots of people have side gigs or they have, you know, um, hobby projects that they want to turn into a real thing or, 
uh, you know, lots of places where having an extra person would be useful and you don't necessarily need someone who knows all the, all the things already, especially if it's like a, a hobby project where your schedule is flexible or whatever. So uh, my thought was it would be a really cool thing if there was a, um, an organization that could help put people on a path. Uh, so let's say you're, you know, you've um, worked in construction or in, um, you know, some manual field and you want to write software. Um, so we'll point you in a direction of uh, like free code camp. Uh, well, first we'll, we'll start with like, what are you interested in? What do you want to do? Do you want to make web pages? Do you want to, you know, build electronics that have software on them? Um, and once we figured out what your interests are, we point you at self-paced resources for getting started uh, and for evaluating your progress. And then once you're to a point where um, having one-on-one -on -one interactions would be useful, we pair you with someone who needs an intern, basically. Uh, it could be an organization like ORI, um, where, you know, during the summer trying to, you know, put in some work on one of the FPGA projects, you take an intern, or it could be like my friend Andrew, who, you know, wanted to do a good thing and had some development projects that he was going to need help on. Um, so it's kind of a um, skill up plus um, matchmaking HR and also uh, providing training for mentors, right? So for people who want to do this, who want to have an intern or who want to provide mentorship, um, even if it's unpaid, right? Like if it's just mentorship, not it's not interning, you know, how to be an effective mentor, how to be, uh, how to uh, effectively manage an intern, that kind of stuff. So both sides of the equation, helping people make career transitions, maybe go and bug the companies that are, you know, uh, turning profits by laying off people and get them to uh, help people find new jobs. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to do some really cool stuff. Um, and I think um, there's probably a, a lot of people uh, that would have an interest in taking advantage of this from one side or the other. So uh, it, it's just the bare bones, you know, skeleton of the idea at the moment, but I don't know what to do with it from here. So. I think this is sounds fantastic. Um, and we have done chunks of this or swaths of this uh, pretty much across the board. We, we do um, take on people for professional development and, and in a lot of cases, the various projects that we have, that's, that's the motivating sort of driver, um, you know, from everything from RF Bitbanger to Ribbit to, to Hyferia to, and so on. What you've done is you've, you've, thought about this and and with a with some very observant skill here you've you've laid out like a a, for, a more formal specific or explicit path you know to to kind of meet people where they are and take an inventory and then provide advice on like there's the um you know this there's a whole lot of self-paced and free things out there and i can give it i can give two examples there's an excellent um self-guided tutorial from gnu radio for getting into SDR very quickly. There's also some some excellent uh, free courses, uh, many many hours worth of courses from from MathWorks uh, to to get good at uh, dealing with with MATLAB to use MATLAB and Simulink yeah. for DSP. And then oh. yeah, and then and then if, all the way back to like Khan Academy and W two AEW's YouTube account, which is phenomenal. It's really oh, yeah. really I love, good. I love his stuff. So and those are the things that we routinely recommend to people if they ask, like, well, how, so how do I learn? And, and preferably for free, you know, there's all, a lot of free resources. And then the third part was to like to pair up, to to make a match, to, to recommend. And we do have some success here. We've we've tried to apply for Google Summer of Code to as a project. But it's very competitive. We've never been able to get approved as a Google Summer of Code project. Do they do the funding for that? Yes, they do. They, oh, they wow. provide funding for for their for that, um, which is usually not a whole lot since it's 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 all so it's supposed to all be software. But yes, right. they do provide some some amount of, of funding for a Google Summer of Code. But we on the flip side, we've also uh, directed students to apply as a Google Summer of Code student volunteer, and then supported them and you know kind of given them a, a little shove uh, to oh, get awesome. involved with Google Summer of Code. There's a lot of potential interaction that we, I mean, there's a lot of interaction that we had in the past with IEEE, where finding people, um, some sort of volunteer role or matchmaking essentially for uh, for IEEE. Um, oh, that's cool. It, it, uh, 
in order to kind of be a full volunteer, you do have to kind of join. It's oh, currently yeah. like two hundred and fifty dollars for for a full full test member. It's been a while but, since I was an IEEE member. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that, there's so much going on there, and that we've had we've had a lot of positive experiences with IEEE. They've been extremely supportive, and we've come in as a uh, like a sponsor, uh, which is no cost to us to sponsor events um, well, for the cool. most part at at IEEE, like the meetings and 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 section level stuff. Uh, and you know we we have a lot of good interactions with with some of the projects. Um, so that that all sounds really cool. Like uh, and uh, I'm I'm actually I'm really interested in sort of the experience of working with other organizations to manage those relationships or to you know to find those opportunities. The the th sort of differentiator that I'm I'm thinking about, like when you say intern, you think a college. Uh, you know, I said college kid, I'm 45 years old. Uh, you think, you know, a, a young adult who's graduating from college um, soon. And I, you know, there is infrastructure in place for that. There, you know, companies mm -hmm. do that all the time. Yeah, there's uh, a lot I'm, of attention paid to the, co right. like the college level interns. But... Which is, which is cool. And it's, it's good. Like having actual industry experience, I think is, is crucial because I've, I've worked with, you know, college grads who've never been in industry and it's, it can be frustrating uh, for, for everyone involved. Um, but I, so what Andrew did, uh, was he found someone who was not a student who was like, I, I don't, I don't know what their background was, but it was not in tech at all, right. but they had an interest in, in moving in that direction. So I, I think that's an underserved demographic and a probably a fairly large one. Strongly uh, you, concur. You, I yeah. strongly agree. I, um, the vast majority of the people that, that are, that we, I would, I guess you would consider them to be sort of interns or technical volunteers is the, you know, when they, when they come to us and want to work on a project, the vast majority are, are not students. They're not right out of college. Right. So they're not the, the, the traditional sort yeah. of person. And that's, so, yeah. that is, I've, I've seen that. And, and I strongly agree that it's very underserved and kind of under, underappreciated. There, there is kind of this mindset of well if you don't have a degree buzz off you know yeah that somehow i don't have a high school there's... education and i've been and i managed to work in this industry for 25 years right yeah. uh it's but it's hard it's it's and it's a lot harder today than it was when i started right like i couldn't do it today i don't think um i was fortunate enough to know people to get my first couple of jobs and then from there i could leverage my past experience but like you know someone who's been you know an auto mechanic since they were 18 and now they're they're 30 and they want to make a career change, well, they can either, you know, go spend forty thousand dollars on a boot camp that may or may not get them a job and isn't really going to prepare them very well for, you know, anything in particular. Uh, or they can try and find a open source project to contribute to. But that because it's open source, because it's all volunteer, it can be very tricky. Uh, you know, there's friction there. Um, and if you've never done that before, it, it's it's intimidating. Uh, if you have done it before, it's intimidating. Yeah. Um, and yeah, each project is its own its own thing. You know, its own thing, and it, the 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 variety of experiences ranging from really good to really bad in in open oh, source. Yeah. The dynamic range is huge. It's, it's huge. Uh, it's <laughs> makerspaces too, right? Like it, yeah. it's, it it attracts it attracts a couple of very specific personality types, and you know that can yeah. work really well or it can work really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it it can be it can be challenging, um. But yeah, I'd love to see, and I'd love to be involved in whatever way. Uh, I, I'd like okay. to see something that tackles this problem that, you know, people who, you know, are like, my daughter is autistic um, and, you know, she has an interest in technology, um, but like, she's never going to go to college, right? Like she's not that, that, that environment is going to, would destroy her. Um, and, you know, so I'm teaching her the stuff I can teach her and, and, and she's going to be, she'll be okay. But there are, you know, how many uh, kids on the spectrum whose dad isn't a software developer who doesn't have those resources, uh, you know, what do they do? So, you know, again, not just that, but everybody who's, you know, trying to trying to do something better than than working at McDonald's or, uh, or you know, or is just not happy doing what they're doing and wants to try something else. Like, I'd love to see people have those opportunities. I've long held a belief that there's nothing special about software, right? Like, it's just problem solving. And most people, if they sit down and work at it, they can solve problems. And uh, the rest of it is just knowing how to explain the solution to the computer, right? If you break it down into those terms, I think anybody can do it. It's just more, more people need the opportunity. So I, I think this is a way to do it. Uh, I just don't know how to 
how to make it happen. Uh, like I've, I've never, I've been involved in nonprofits as, you know, a member. Uh, I was actually um, president of a nonprofit, which meant I ran two meetings once a year, uh, uh, once a year uh, for two years. And that was my experience there. I just don't know where to go from here. So I, I was hoping that, you know, if it's something that ORI, that fits the ORI mission, that'd be awesome to see it happen here. If it's not, then maybe you know where to go uh, to give it a chance. And, you know, if I can be a part of, of seeing it move forward, that'd be awesome. But really, I'd just like to see it happen. Okay. I think uh, from, I think you're hired. Um, so yeah, okay. let's, let's try to, let's try to make this happen. Cause this is all of these ingredients are things that we're already at pretty much uh, they're in the water. This is, this is just how we, we do. And the, I could not agree any more strongly with your, the inclusive and positive uh, attitude that you've very eloquently expressed here today it it is that is absolutely the truth and it's why we tell people that you do not have to be an expert to join you just have to be willing to become more of one along the way and when we say that to people that's that's we say it because we, we're living it you know and it's hard to sell and that it's it really is hard extremely to hard to sell we have had some very negative reactions to this sort of uh approach uh, we have, and we, we know that those organizations and foundations are, are not our friends, and that's okay. We'll just It's simply... good to know who your friends are. It is. <laughs> it's good to know who your friends are. They do they us are. a favor by revealing, um, you know, their, their, their... Yes. And, you know, the, overall, I think that we have, we, I have, it's just, this is my observation over, over the years, we have narrowed the definition of you know, we've, we've made gatekeeping and, and, and narrowing the definition of it, like what is an acceptable student, what is, what's a, what is a successful worker, what's a successful person, what, what sort of, it, it, we've, we've made it much narrower, we're much less willing to accept the broader yeah, variety of Yeah, someone who doesn't people. fit the specific mold. Yeah, and, and that's true, very true in engineering. And it's to our, to our detriment. I think so. I was I was part of the last class uh, it, as an undergraduate. I, get, I got a degree in something called engineering technology. So it's not a double E degree. Um, it's very related, and and the the theoretical work uh, sure felt just as hard. The difference was that all of our classes required a lab, and in a traditional sort of double E degree, you might get some labs, you know. And so I'd rather gave... work with you than an EE. Then <laughs> like. Well, it's it. Uh, I at the time it was a compromise, and I thought that it was it's considered a lesser degree by That's ridiculous. Um, by by most the the double E Just gets because there's more less theory. theory. There's a little less wow. theory, and there's more lab. The so the engineering tech degree is not as popular. And my class, my graduating class, was the last one that was allowed to sit for the engineer uh, for the professional engineer. Um, uh, process so so what? you get a you get an EIT which is the engineer and training certificate and then you after a couple of years of of working as a as an engineer you're allowed to sit for the professional engineer exam yeah to be a and I've always hated the PE gatekeeping to begin with well, right yeah. like I feel like <laughs> if you can pass the exam you should be allowed to pass the exam yeah uh, that's and that's how it used to be it was if you could pass the exam you got to call yourself a professional engineer and it changed from now you had to have a college degree which is an enormous step forward in gatekeeping and then my my year was the last year allowed and you know, then it was only double e's or emmys ridiculous. or whatever's and they were they cut out the entire Copies. yeah, yeah. so yeah. i i ha i still keep my my engineer and my engineering intern certificate i still keep it current and at some point i've i ever so often i get uh tempted to go through the process of of like sitting for the pe exam get it filling out all the paperwork to get a license just, just to thumb your note just to thumb my notes oh, i i'm <laughs> yeah. 100% here you for you if you crowd <laughs> crowdfund your exam costs yes. i will contribute <laughs> okay, thank you it's just ah oh, it's just it's a it is kind of a, a pain to to do, but yeah, it it was. I was like, why are they? They're they're basically saying my entire uh, this entire degree program, my entire university is the, garbage, the, the, and the, only know, the, the years people you spent are, doing that are pointless. Yeah, just yeah. just you pretend it didn't happen. Yes, and so it's it's always hit me wrong, and it it really kind of sensitized me pretty early to like how gatekeeping feels when you're the one outside the gate, and it's not it's never great. Fun. It's never fun, and. Yeah, I think that we have this trajectory has continued over the years, and and we're the repercussions seem pretty harsh to me. But I guess 
gatekeeping uh, is profitable for somebody. You know, it's uh, making sure that the credentials are are rare means that that you know uh, the people that have them salaries. Are uh, higher. Yeah, salaries are higher, and, and I think that that all, you know, once you once you make it um, lucrative for someone to to be kind of part of a system that does the gatekeeping, there's there's a lot of that at all different levels, and you know. Sure, some some amount of of enforcing repercussions and gatekeeping is necessary in order to to have things be basically safe. But it's, it's like so like anything else, it's a balance, and uh, there's a lot of stuff in tech that's out of out of whack right now with the you know with the way that we do things, and and it's uh you know this this process that you that right you've back. outlined. I'll be right at the door. I'm sorry. Oh sure. Yeah, I really like this since we already do this informally and in a distributed manner. This sort of reminds me of our attempt to do an engineer's general program. I think probably Paul remembers that. I do. Yeah, it's very similar. Except that with engineers general, we were going to we offered to employ people like to for contractors but uh this sounds like it would be less work <laughs> really well it's still it's, it's the good work you know to to support and build and and to get people um you know involved and engaged and and moving forward but then we wouldn't we wouldn't be the eventual target for the for the contractor having to manage it I've taken, taken notes on this back of this envelope, so I'll I can write up a memo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Would you have any thoughts on what you've heard so far, Paul? No. Um, or any objections I, or. I have half a clue about how to solve technical problems i don't i don't have any fraction of a clue on how to solve this kind of society problem they're hard <laughs> they're they're very difficult you know like my degree program that i that i come from and keith keith wheeler came from we we graduated i think almost the same year uh and all my a lot of other friends that are that work um like Stephen o'connor he works um for a for a big contractor in uh, in uh, in Arkansas, um, all of us are highly successful technical people. Do engineering work, and it wasn't very many years after that uh, that my undergraduate institution was kind of cut off from from letting people go forward with the EIT PE thing that they completely changed the entire technical program. So that that engineering technology degree was sunsetted and they 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 fired up a systems engineering what they called a systems engineering degree which was a four-year degree in IT so it was computer systems and computer administration the school already had a computer science department you know is that qualified for a PE degree you know that's a really good question I don't for, for a think PE so I don't for a PE yeah, I wouldn't think so, but like if they, it's crazy that they replaced your, your track with with that. That's just ridiculous. Uh, so someone was showed up, looking for Mark, uh, thinking they were supposed to be at my house to cut out my air conditioner, and he had, oh dear, <laughs> had planned to just go back and start working on it. Oh god! But it's running, and so he'd come to like be like, hey, can you shut off the air conditioner so I can cut it out? I'm like, I, no, 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 I can't. <laughs> uh, wow so that was yeah there was there were some phone calls we figured it out he was i'm at 103 north and i thought he wanted 103 south it turns out he wanted 108 north so that was almost uh but yeah he was also looking for someone named mark who was, you know it's just crazy coincidence anyway it is sorry i had to step away like quite the adventure yeah we were yeah we were we were been talking about this uh this very interesting you know, this, this foolishness yeah, this foolish. <laughs> yeah, it's tackling a like you know Paul says it's tackling a, a pretty se severe you know a cultural social you know problem. But you know I think that we we have already made progress in this area and with a 
with a sort of a, a, a I, would, I hesitate to say formalization, you know, because that tends to scare people off. You know, we just we like getting things done and we do like documenting. So I think doing yeah. some documentation here and kind of it helps crystallize the the things that we already are doing in a very decentralized, like per project manner. But but this is this largely is our mission and this is what we we feel strongly about doing. You know, this is cool. the sort of the vocational work that we that we want to to do. We want to engage people. We really want to be accessible and, you know, so, uh, welcoming so my, and all that. My my sort of like initial thought of where this might go was kind of like a, um, if it was a standalone thing, like a, a nonprofit kind of, um, you know, both for um, people who need help and want to provide mentorship and all, and also for people who are looking for mentorship. If we did, did it within ORI, I think it would be interesting from a process perspective to like look at sort of what what makes the most sense from those perspectives for those two paths and documenting that. Like I know you, you've mentioned some good resources. There are some resources that I'm aware of for developers. Um, there's a, uh, I don't know if it still exists, but there was kind of like a um it was it grew out of a project to github and it was learning languages and they had like 40 different languages and they had exercises along with lessons so that that gave you kind of the um the self-evaluation checking your progress kind of thing uh maybe partnerships with like leak code um or one of the um the coding test providers uh, and coding challenge companies would be useful. And again, my expertise is in the coding in the, in the software side of things. Um, another thing that I think would be kind of neat um, for people who have a background in software doing transitions to uh, either embedded systems or in, into HDL, um, you know, FPGA, like it's totally different process and a different way of thinking about things. Um, I've done a little bit of it and it made my head hurt. Uh, yeah uh, well, like i get it, that I never get goes away actually <laughs> but i've uh, yeah uh i've been writing <laughs> software for too long to write hardware uh without without some major effort it's, it is still something i want to do and i i like building electronics i love doing I, and i can i understand that but uh like having having sort of um not necessarily like predefined paths but like you know if you're looking to move from this type of work to this type of work these are the sorts of things you might try you know uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities there within sort of the areas of expertise of ORI specifically, but uh, yeah, if if we trial it here and it turns out to work, I'd love to see it become a bigger thing. Um, okay. That's, you know, more accessible. Yeah, let's uh, let's see what we can do then. I think this is great. Cool. Yeah, let me uh, let me know how I you know how I can help. Uh, like I'm I I will write up the ideas that I've got and send them to you. Um, okay. Yeah, let's do that. Let's collaborate on some writing and get like okay. maybe. I, I don't know, I, sort of white paper-ish, you know, but at least like a an essay or yeah, yeah. Uh, capture capture these things in a in a in a document and um For sure. yeah, if you want to kick it off as like a shared Google Doc or anything that you I prefer that. to use, you know, if they. But maybe I expect Google Documents to stay around for the next couple of weeks, so we should be safe. Um, they, they, yeah, at least the next couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, so so while at Salesforce, they, I don't know if they bought. Or if they developed in house a suite called uh, Quip, Q U I P, uh, and it was basically Google Docs but at Salesforce, and they they made us use them, uh, and it was terrible. So oh, yeah, dear. Google Docs, Google Docs be fine as long as yeah you don't have yeah a whatever Quip. yeah whatever you prefer. Um, and then like, we'll, I, I don't we'll have a problem with Salesforce's app, but man, Quip was awful. Oh dear. Well, you know, yes. I mean, Google Docs is good. Yeah. It sounds like they made you use it like the dog food approach. It, it to... was a dog fooding thing. Yeah. And it was the worst. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Cool. I'm glad. Okay. That, like I said, I'm happy to, happy that I got laid off. I'm, I'm taking my severance and the savings that I had. And uh, I am trying to change industries. I'm, I'm actually trying to move into um, making custom woods, woodworking stuff. Oh, wow. But, okay. Uh, I make pens. I, I think I told you that. Yeah, you uh, did. But also moving into making like, you know, small furniture and um like keepsake boxes and that kind of stuff uh and and doing software for fun so yeah i think that combination might be 
might be highly successful. <laughs> I hope so. I hope I can afford to keep doing that because it's a lot less stress. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, so I, I'm, uh, I will write that up and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you very much uh, for for taking the time to listen and for the. Oh sure, no, this is. Uh, I'm I'm actually inspired and heartened. I think um, you you have expressed it so very well and really clarified the this process you know this sort of the tendency or, or sort of vocational work that we do and made it clear and understandable and and it's it really does fit with with how we do business so i awesome. uh, yeah well, let's try you. let's see what we can do to. and if you uh, if you have a name for the in your in your mind have you, have you come I, up I with will some talk sort to my friend of name Andrew, or... uh, who who's the inspiration for this like uh, i i just like was thinking of it as like private internships or or you know private mentorships, um, but I don't have I don't have anything catchy yet. Okay, yeah, I'll uh, I'll I'll, I'll uh, assign uh, some yeah, some. If little you come up with a name, I'm, I'm fine with it. it. Yeah, we'll try to figure it out. A catchy name is always uh, is a you know, and then and there's important. something to ce celebrate. You know that we That's can right. throw a party for our you know the new name. It's got a, it's such a cool idea. It deserves a. Yeah, you know, deserves a good name. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll think about it as well. I uh, since uh, leaving my job, I've I've been filling notebooks with ideas and names for things is probably the worst part. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> Very cool. good. All right. Thank you. All right. Bro. Oh, you bet. That, was, that thank you. This is a you know what a what a great thing to hear about. All right. Anybody anybody else want the floor for for comments or questions or ideas? Anybody need anything? Okie dokie. Well, I will be on on Slack and I'll be in town uh, here in San Diego through the 27th of June. And I'll be traveling from the 27th to the 2nd of July. Um, I will be in uh, Northeastern Mississippi working uh, my day job and uh, should be able to, to Stay online for that, but uh, but uh, just let you know, we'll be out of town. Um, cool. Okay. See you guys on Slack. See see everybody on Slack. And uh, th thanks so much for the really wonderful meetup today. Um, looking forward to to uh, meeting back up again next week. And I'll also try to to put together uh, another meetup uh, later in the week for for the evening hours and uh, on the on the west coast so we can catch uh, some other folks that couldn't be here today all right so thanks everybody see you thanks soon. so much michelle